So hello and welcome back to another session on methodology of literature. We continue with formalism. We'll start with, I did uh, tell you in the last class that we will begin with Mikhail Bakhtin, a very important formalist and some of his concepts. Now I want you to be all ears. You may not be able to understand clearly with just one hearing. So I request you after our discussion session of course, you can listen to it again and again because to understand Mikhail Bakhtin, it takes time. So um, I hope you will be able to uh, understand and if you don't just watch the video, listen to the video again. All right, and we have further doubts, even after listening to the videos, if your doubts are not cleared, you please feel free to call me. Okay, so let's begin. So Mikhail Bakhtin was the most influential figures, not only in the field of Western literary theory, but also in the field of 20th century humanities in general. He published only two books under his uh, name during his lifetime. The rest of his creative output is primarily in the form of long essays compiled and published only after his death. One reason why Bakhtin enjoys such great reputation within the field of literary studies is the striking uniqueness of his work. Thus, Bakhtin was associated with the intellectual circles of Russian formalism. Before we move to his concepts, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Mikhail Bakhtin that is his biography because only if you understand his biography will you be able to understand some of his uh, concepts. Of course the formalists never believed in biography uh, or uh, the social historical context but this is for us to understand Bakhtin. It has nothing to do with formalism but just for um, a better understanding of his concepts, I feel that we must understand Bakhtin and his, uh, the, and his upbringing because only then you will be able to understand why he is in for a lot of plurality, especially when it comes to polyglossia, you will have to know uh, about Bakhtin and his education and where he uh, uh, was brought up. Um, and how he was, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, exposed to various languages and uh, culture uh, at, uh, as well. And so let's begin. Bakhtin was not known to the world until 1960s. He was discovered by he suffered a lot. Okay, he suffered a lot because of these because of his close association with Russian formalism and I did tell you that formalism was suppressed by the uh, government of the day he came or uh, he was not liked or in fact he was a target of Stalin uh, his Stalin's fury was all around him and he even his doctoral thesis uh, was uh, was uh, you know it led to a lot of controversy he was not given his phd it took him one year to uh, fight for it uh, several controversies were related with him again that's all because of the russian government of the day and it was only during the later years, the autumn years of his life that uh, he became uh, known to the world uh, uh, and that too when he was accidentally discovered by a group of young scholars who had come across his works in the Maxim Gorky Institute of Moscow. They, they decided to bring him to the limelight and save him from obscurity. He was also discovered by the Western academic world at large during the same time when his 
uh, book Rebellious and His World was published uh, in uh, English translation in 1968. It is also important to note here that for long there was only text of Bhaktin which uh, the Western Academia knew him. Okay. Uh, his popularity surged further only during the 1980s when his other works uh, were also made uh, available in translation. So the Western world got to know him only through his books and that too only through his, you know, partly through some of his, some, his books that were made available in translation and later after his death or later his, his works uh, also the rest of his works also made available in translation. Now Bakhtin was born in 1895 in a Russian town called Oriel but mostly he grew up in cities like Vilnius and Odessa. Uh, the re reason why I mention uh, these places is because the impact that these places had on Bhaktin in terms of language was enormous. Bhaktin from his early age could speak not only Russian but also German which he picked up from his governess. This acquaintance with multiple language was only enhanced with his mo move to Vilnius that is in the modern Lithuania. Okay, where through though the official language uh, was Russian, the local people mostly spoke Polish or Lithuanian. Now, why I am telling you all this is see, he was constantly exposed to various uh, languages, various culture. Okay, and also Odisha where he grew up as a young boy spoke varied languages. Thus Bhaktan's exposure to different so social milieus where various, uh, where various languages are equally accepted had a profound influence in Bhaktan and his theories of many languagedness. I want you to remember this when we shall be taking this up when we study his polyglossia and heteroglossia. Okay, so I want you to bear this in mind that he was exposed to various social milieus and also various languages. Now these languages were equally accepted though it were different provinces of Russia some spoke Polish some spoke German he, sp he picked up German from his governess uh, so he he was exposed to many languagedness. Okay, uh, he took his doctoral thesis on Rabalis in 1920, um, and uh, the work was titled "Problems of Dostoevsky's uh, Art," and later expanded and published under slightly different uh, title, uh, "Dostoevsky's Poetics." Now, uh, the year 1920, when his book, Dostoevsky book was published, Bakhtin was arrested and sent on exile to a distant part of Kazakhstan, which is now, which was then a part of the Soviet Union. Now, it was here that he completed some of his important monographs on the study of uh, the novel as a literary genre, some of which now forms part of the translated collection of his essays titled The Dialogic Imagination. I want you to remember this name, this uh, name of the book, The Dialogic Imagination, where uh, when he was in exile, when he was uh, arrested and sent to Kazakhstan, he completed some of his monographs on the study of novel as a literary genre and these are now translated as a collective work, a collective essay. Uh, the essay is titled Dialogic Imagination by Mikhail Bakhtin. Okay. In late 1930s and early 1940s, Bakhtin completed two other works. 
The first one was the study on Bildungsroman or the novel of education which exists only as fragments today as this manuscript of Bakhtin uh, which was sent to his German publisher was destroyed during the Second World War. And amusing it is or ironical it is that he, the, the only copy that he had with him, he used it uh, when he ran out of cigarette papers, he used it to roll cigars or cigarettes when he ran out of cigarette papers or absence of cigarette papers. So uh, we get, we have that book or his study on Bildungsroman. Uh, or the novel of education only in parts, okay, only in fragments. Now the second book was Rebellious and His World, which he submitted for his PhD. But this book went through a lot of controversy. I told you, Stalin, he was very angry with uh, the, uh, sorry, Bakhtin and he had to go through a lot of torture. Uh, Bakhtin's fortune really began to turn in 1960s when he was discovered, that is his work was discovered by a large number of readers within and abroad Russia. Bakhtin was terribly ill and he had lost a leg due to a bone disease and had settled down as a humble German teacher in an obscure town of Russia. But on the discovery of his work by a group of students at Maxim Gorky Institute of uh, World Literature, it brought him back and he was, he is now hailed or he was now hailed as an intellectual hero. Now his last years were spent in Moscow where he returned back to the philosophical interest that he had began in his younger days and worked on his essays which he had produced before Dostoevsky book. These are however not uh, published in his lifetime. It was only after his death in 1975 that these along with, uh, with most of the other important monographs uh, on literary studies were compiled and published. As mentioned before, Bakhtin really became a phenomenon in the Western Academia only after 1980s. Thus, though some of his work now date back almost a century, their impact even today is, has a kind of freshness within this, the field of Western literary theory. Now let's begin with his concepts. Now I want you to pay attention because these concepts are going to be a little tricky, uh, but you should be all ears and as I told you, uh, if you have any doubts, uh, just uh, uh, watch the video again and listen to what I say uh, carefully so that you will get a better uh, picture of Mikhail Bakhtin. Now let's begin with polyphony first. Before moving into polyphony is a part of dialogism. Now polyphony, only after understanding polyphony will you be able to understand dialogism. And before we move on to polyphony, we should be able to understand how polyphony is different from monologism. Okay, and what is monologism? So let's begin. So with this background in place, let us now move towards Bakhtin's theoretical concepts. And the first set of ideas that we shall take up is the notion of polyphony and its relation with dialogism. Now the word is originally used to denote certain piece of music in which different melod melodic lines are sung or played simultaneously and parallel to each other to achieve harmony. Now Bakhtin borrowed this term from the world of music and used it to signify what he considered as unique and uh, a unique feature in the characteristic of Dostoevsky's novel. Now, uh, 
before uh, no i want you to listen to uh, this uh, video from that i took from youtube and i want you to understand what polyphony is only if you understand that will you be able to get an idea i i, I did tell you that it is related to music and it is where you have uh, uh, different lines different melodic lines that are sung simultaneously and it goes parallel to each other in harmony but uh, only when you listen to it will you be able to understand their concept so i want you to listen to that slide I wanted to show you an example of a polyphonic texture, but unfortunately there wasn't a Pop Goes the Weasel polyphonic example that I could find. So I'm going to show you this instead, which is a piece of music by J.S. Bach. And as I said, J.S. Bach is kind of the master of polyphonic textures and particularly this thing called imitative counterpoint, which we might talk about in sometime in the future. But the main thing we're talking about here when we're looking at polyphonic texture is we're looking at a texture where there isn't a really clear melody part and there isn't a really clear harmony part or accompaniment part. And we definitely see that here. This is a piece of music for keyboard. So it might be for a piano or probably more likely a harpsichord or some other earlier version of a keyboard instrument. Again, if you don't really read music, that's totally fine. I'm not really expecting you to be able to read all of these notes, but instead just look at how the dots are arranged on the page. So this line up here and in the lines below is for the right hand and the second of the two lines is for the left hand. And what we'll see is that the right hand part and the left hand part are both kind of quite independent and quite melodic. So there isn't a really obvious right hand part that's the melody and the left hand part that's the accompaniment or the chords like we had in the previous homophonic example. Instead, we've got something quite different here where if we look at each part separately, they have some quite nice melodic elements to them and that's what makes this music really special in that the, the melody is being passed from left hand to right hand all the time and that's quite an interesting effect. If we take this first line as an example what we'll see is something quite interesting that a melodic idea is being passed from the left hand to the right hand. This is what the first line sounds like in the right hand. This set of running 16th notes is quite an important feature of the music. And it's a melodic kind of idea. It's definitely the tune of the music at that point. But what we'll see is that when we go into the left hand, that same idea, that same little melodic idea is appearing an octave lower in the left hand part. And that's where Bach is being really clever here because he's not just taking one hand to be the melody part and the other hand to be the accompaniment part. Instead, he's kind of chucking the melody from hand to hand and creating a really interesting textured effect with his music. And I'm going to play the rest of the opening of this composition and hopefully you'll keep hearing that little figure sometimes appearing in the right hand and sometimes appearing in the left hand. I'm going to do my best to try and draw it in when it comes in the music. And this is what polyphonic texture is really great at, passing little melodic snippets around from hand to hand, and it can be a really exciting effect. There we go. So I'd recommend you go and have a listen to this piece. You can find it on YouTube. It's called Invention Number One by J.S. Bach. And there's loads more inventions by him that make use of this idea of polyphony, this idea of passing little melodic ideas from one part to the other. And there being no very obvious melody part and no very obvious harmony part. Instead, lots of strands of melody are kind of woven together to make a really interesting texture. So I hope uh, you listen to that uh, uh, music uh, and you understood what polyphony is. Now let's look at some of Bakhtin's, uh, you know, what Bakhtin has written in his preface. 
uh, to Dostoevsky's novel. Uh, so Bakhtin writes, uh, quote, uh, we consider Dostoevsky one of the greatest innovators in the realm of artistic form. He created, in our opinion, a completely new type of artistic thinking, which we have provisionally called polyphonic." Unquote. Now, let's come back to this idea that polyphony is something invented as a literary device by Dostoevsky because as Bakhtin says in his book Dostoevsky's Poetics, he treats it as a universal phenomenon. So, it is not something that is created by Bakhtin, it was created before Bakhtin, it was created by Dostoevsky, it could have been created by somebody else also. So, it is a universal phenomenon what this polyphony okay and how it exists in the novel it is uh, again uh, more universal in nature all right so Bakhtin explains this more elaborately what he means by the use of polyphony in Dostoevsky's novel now again I move into what Bakhtin says I want you to listen to this quote uh, very carefully okay a plurality these are Bakhtin's words a plurality don't worry you will I will be explaining what it means after uh, uh, telling you um, of what Bakhtin has to uh, tell about the Stoesky's novel and what pl uh, polyphony is uh, so just listen carefully a plurality of independent and unmerged voices and consciousness, a genuine polyphony of fully valid voices. In fact, the chief character is in fact the chief characteristic of Dostoevsky's novels. What unfolds in his work is not multitude of characters and fates in a single objective world illuminated by a single authorial consciousness, rather a plurality of consciousness with equal rights and each and uh, each with its own world combined not only not merged in unity of the event. Dostoevsky's major heroes are, by the very nature of his creative design, not only objects of authorial discourse but also subjects of their own directly signifying discourse. Now, don't worry, just listen attentively. Now, there are two things I would like to focus your attention on based on what we quoted from. Uh, Bakhtin on Dostoevsky's novel, his observation on Dostoevsky's novel. So, based on what I said just now, I want you to focus on two things. One, how polyphony is being defined. Here, it is important to note that polyphony is being defined not merely as plurality of voice, that is, many voices from many characters, but not plurality of voice that is many voices from many characters but what but as a plurality of independent and unmerged voices as well as our consciousness so what do we have a plurality in all sense a plurality of characters a plurality of independent thinking independent perspectives independent uh, uh, what is it unmerged not the merged voice of the author or merged voice of the hero or the protagonist alone but the an unmerged voice of almost all the characters present in the novel. That is important here. The idea of plurality. They are treated as a notion or an idea that we will see in a moment. How that plurality is treated as an idea. But before that, 
uh, you just have to again listen just listen carefully there is also another thing that i want to uh, want you to focus on and that which is quoted from the passage here that is how polyphony is contrasted with the single or unity of single authorial consciousness so you have plurality and singularity <clears throat> what is the difference between plural and singular you know right plural is many singular is one now here you have plurality of consciousness plurality of uh, um, uh, independent voices and they are unmerged okay they are unmerged voices now they are uh, put in stark contrast with what they are put in stark contrast with unity of single authorial consciousness now what is this what does it mean now try to think of a novel that you have read recently you may have encountered many characters in the novel each speaking their different lines this is a kind of plurality of voices but according to bakhtin this does not automatically mean that a novel that you read can be categorized as a polyphonic novel you may have so many characters you may have so many dialogues in it but it needn't be a plurality it could be just one single authorial consciousness what does it mean maybe all the characters in the novel they utter the same perspective if they are going to utter the same viewpoint or the same perspective of the author the authorial con consciousness that is single it's not a polyphonic novel it's not plurality it's just singular singularity or monologic clear so uh, in other words plurality of voices does not automatically a plurality of voices so many voices or so many characters speaking different different lines speaking different different dialogues uh, does not lead to genuine polyphony <clears throat> this is because according to bakhtin many novels are written in a way that conveys just a single consciousness it takes a lot of pain a lot of talent to write a plurality or or uh, to create a polyphonic novel the single world view that is almost if you uh, according to bakhtin's observation almost all the novels are or most of the novels not all the novels most of the novels especially the ones in the medieval times the ones in the modern period the mo modern uh, period like you have shakespeare in plays also that we will be discussing in detail uh, if you look at those plays it, it actually speaks though there are various characters it's the monologues that are more in it monologues what are monologues where the he the the uh, the, the uh, character either speaks a soliloquy or he goes for an aside so that the uh, the uh, the listener or the audience can get to hear his thoughts now what happens here is the plural the there is no singularity the author is giving these perspectives to the protagonist and the protagonist is using them uh to show from uh, it shows from his perspective everyone in the story is uh narrated through his perspective so there is only a singular authority or singular uh, authorial voice single consciousness because there is it may look like there are many characters it, there would be many many characters there would be many many dialogues other than the monologues there would there would be dialogues also but mostly what happens is there is a lot of uh, what one person one man speaking his views so if you look at it again the protagonist does not have his own view again it is the view point of whom the author the authorial conscience so it's like a no man spirit that's what bakhtin calls uh, so Uh, let's come back so uh, you may have as i told you you may have many characters in the novel speaking their lines and dialogues they are but they are mostly single authorial conscience that is the view of the writer or the author hence they are not polyphonic they they act merely so they act as many mouthpieces of the author who is writing his single view point 
there we feel there is plurality of speeches but it is only just an illusion but not plurality of ways in which the world is being looked at or engaged with you will not find different viewpoints different perspectives different perspectives of different characters you will only have one single perspective and that is the perspective of the author the every character in the right in the novel looks at the world from the author's point of view the, whereas polyphony is not that here in monology so that is how we uh, uh, you know we sh can differentiate between a polyphonic novel and a monologic novel or a, even if it comes to a drama this attitude not just happens in novels but also in dramas as well in drama the illusion of plurality is even more intense because why as we physically encounter we physically encounter uh, the characters speaking their own different lines this is not polyphonic we are seeing them speaking to us they speak we are seeing them speaking to the uh, audience okay uh, so it the 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 impact it ha it has this feeling illusion of creating polyphonic novel or polyphonic uh, polyphony is more intense in drama than in novel it's more uh, visible or it's more uh, you know intense so this is not polyphonic however it is just an illusion of being polyphonic because though the author is not visible on stage the lines that all the characters speak might just be the many echoes of the single authorial consciousness the author it is just the many echoes many viewpoints of whom the single person each character speaking through whose perspective each character speaking through the perspective of the author the author is not giving freedom to the character or he is not the author is not putting himself into the shoes of the character and looking at the world from that perspective rather he is giving his viewpoint his idea his world to the uh, to the characters okay so that is called single authorial or uh, authorial consciousness so uh, this underlying unity and the sameness in a novel and by extension in any literary form that is either in a drama or in a novel or in a short story this attitude this kind of underlying unity and sameness this single uh, authorial uh, consciousness is what bakhtin calls as monologism we haven't started polyphony we are, i'm just telling you what how monologism is different or polyphony is different from monologism only if you understand what the single authorial consciousness is will you be able to understand what is plurality because what you see is just an illusion of plurality it's actually monologism only it is just the author's viewpoint it doesn't have anything to do with the characters the author does not put himself in the shoe of the character rather he gives life to the character his perspective is given his ideas his thoughts his concepts his viewpoints are given to the characters and they speak they are just many echoes of the uh, author himself so it's just monologism or single authorial consciousness which may appear to be plurality appear to be plurality it gives an illusion of plurality but it is not so you will have different characters you will have different dialogues all that is fine you will feel that there is plurality but it's just who's acting behind it the single person the author he is not putting himself into the shoe of the character he is just giving his viewpoint to the character i hope you understood monology so because we are going to start polyphony so which uh, so this monologism is single utterance single discourse okay and it is opposite of polyphony or dialogism all right so though uh, there are you, you have various characters it just appears to be the viewpoint of the author now this monologism is what bakhtin calls as no man's thought no man's 
idea or more no man's spirit or no man's thought according to bakhtin it is an error a grave error it only has one principle uh, of cognitive individualization it doesn't do anything else so the early modern drama in england were often monological they were full of soliloquies they were full of uh, you know uh, they they uh, they appear to be mono they meaning they have dialogues but it's mostly monological now if you look at hamlet and dr faustus for example are best examples for this they are there are many characters in it and these two characters dr faustus as well as hamlet uh, they en engage themselves uh, with uh, you know more and they uh, more animated and memorable conversations with themselves there are very few dialogues there are the characters there are uh, uh, dialogues but it's mostly this monologues that give the audience uh how to judge the other characters the monologues either the sides of the hero or the soliloquies of the hero that tells you what is happening and that that tells you how others are to be viewed so again you if you look at it it goes back to whom back to the uh, author and the author is voicing all these things there's only one person telling you how to look at the world okay hamlet for instance though his soliloquy is try to interpret uh, to the audience how he uh, you know he, he uh, why he is suffering he looks or his interpretation so his narrations his anger with getrud his mother uh, and how he looks at claudius the person who killed his father are all from shakespeare's view point or it is all from either from hamlet's view point or from shakespeare's view point nobody is looking at what getrud went through nobody wants to know why she may have gone for a uh, uh, you know a uh, uh, very uh, she got married uh, soon okay she, why she hurried with the marriage nobody wants to know why what was claudius reason for killing uh, king hamlet uh, and getting his wife so ham uh, get rude and claudius uh, does not get to speak their perspective they they did they, they does not get to speak about the world from their angle shakespeare does not allow them to speak about uh, the world from their angle in fact shakespeare does not put himself into the shoes of get rude and looks at look at the world from her angle you know he can't he doesn't do it he does not put himself in the shoe of claudius and looks at the world from his angle he doesn't so what happens is he looks only at the world from hamlet's perspective he puts himself only into hamlet's shoe and he looks at the world only from a son who has been betrayed or a son who is grieving he has lost his mother and his mother uh, sorry he's, he has lost his father and his mother is stained okay so he shakespeare looks at it only from that angle so you can say that this is a kind of monologism okay so uh, i hope you understood what uh, this uh, monologism is it just uh, how the author wants it to be so monologism is taken to close down the world it represents by pretending to be the ultimate world so in monological novel the characters exist solely to transmit the author's ideology and the author through each character represent only their idea not anyone else's idea such as the novels uh, bakhtin claim to tend to be featureless these novels these monologic novels they are featureless and they're flat and they are sing they are single toned they are marked by a single tone okay now <clears throat> uh now that uh, you have understood monologism 
it will be easier for you to understand what polyphony and dialogism because it is just the opposite of monologism okay uh, and but uh, uh, in uh, uh, Bakhtin argues that Dostoevsky's noble, novels were uh, able to break free from this monologism. Uh, quote, Dostoevsky's major heroes are by the very nature of his creative design not only objects of authorial discourse but also subjects of their own directly signifying discourse, unquote which means that each of them has a unique consciousness, Dostoevsky's novels. So, Dostoevsky's novels are totally different from the monologic novels. So, from the, his observation of Dostoevsky's novels, the characters in the novels, they have that, that is the one is, uh, which is a best example or true example of polyphony or polyphonic novel. Okay, so it why because it has unique consciousness. Each character, each of them has a unique consciousness, a unique way of interpreting the world around them, as well as a unique way of engaging with this world. And this translates into what Bakhtin calls the plurality of independent and unmerged voices which forms the essence of genuine polyphony. The presence of genuine polyphony creates what Bakhtin calls dialogism. He thus categorizes Dostoevsky's novels as not just polyphonic but also dialogic. So only if you have polyphony in it will it be dialogic. That is they are dialogic in their nature. Now here we have to understand that a literary word or sorry literary work like a novel even a drama might have dialogues it will have dialogues without being dialogic okay it will have dialogues without being dialogic that is as we discussed in hamlet earlier it may have dialogues or lines uttered by different characters but as long as it is pervaded by the single consciousness of the author that is shakespeare in hamlet there is uh, uh, is right and the others uh, are all seen, all the other characters are seen through him, then the literature piece will not be counted as dialogic in Bakhtin's uh, scheme of things. It is considered as monologic. So, what makes Dostoevsky's art different is that he has plurality and that is polyphonic, true form of polyphonic uh, novel and then only only if it is polyphonic can it be dialogic so just because you have dialogues does not make it dialogic so in order to make a work dialogic it should be polyphonic what is polyphonic polyphony refers to having a, a plurality of independent and unmerged voices which forms the essence of genuine polyphony that means each character has unique consciousness every character is unique and every character has a different way of looking at the world it is not looked uh, at by uh, the uh, protagonist alone or the narrator's point of view alone or the writer's point of view alone the writer what does he do he puts himself in the shoe of every character that he has uh, uh, used in the novel or drama and he looks at the world the writer looks at the world not from the writer's point of view but he looks at it from whose point of view from the uh, character's point of view how they would look at the world that's how that is the difference how the characters would look at the world how say for instance uh, hamlet he would analyze if he were to be ham uh, get Rude. How would he look at the world? How would, how would he explain the situations that had happened there? If he were Claudius, how would he define uh, his act of killing or how would he justify his act of killing King uh, Hamlet? Okay, so every 
character would be given what a voice of his own and they are unmerged voices okay they are unmerged and that forms the genuine essence of uh, polyphony and that forms what is referred to as a dialogic novel or dialogic drama so just because you have dialogues does not make it dialogic it has to have plurality and plurality what not seemingly plurality not illusion of plurality but the real plurality which creates genuine polyphony and who has that according to uh, bakhtin it, uh, it is found in the novels of dostoevsky okay and uh, uh, that's uh, we will stop with that because uh, i feel if we move on to the next uh, one it will be too much for you so we'll stop with that i hope you understood what uh, uh, polyphony is and how it is different from monologism or mono monology and what uh, uh, this uh, mm, what is it uh, uh, polyphony is all about and how it forms a true dialogic uh, novel and what dialogism is all about dialogism what makes dialog dialog dialogism the plurality or polyphony is the one that makes a true a genuine uh, dialogic uh, novel or uh, drama so uh, i hope uh, uh, you will uh, learn watch the video again listen to it once more uh, and uh, if you have still have doubts you may uh, call me so until the, uh, we meet next time thank you and keep safe